What's going on everyone? It's Ben from YGO from Zero back with another retro Yu-Gi-Oh format guide. And in this guide, I'm going to be going over what I call PSV format, which is the format right after Pharaoh's Servant gets released where we're using the limited list from the previous format. Now, this is a bit of a tradition on this channel. Basically, whenever a new pack comes out, we explore a new format where we play with that pack's cards, but with no real limits on those cards. So, these formats generally tend to be pretty degenerate, and this format's no exception. But, after just, you know, sort of briefly dipping our toes into this, we'll be diving into the next format, which will be Imperial format. And much of what I'll say in this guide does apply to that format as well. But before I dive in to the guide itself, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please do consider subscribing. You know, we missed our 500 subscriber goal for February. Right now, we're just under 450, but it would be really awesome to reach that goal in March. So if you enjoy my content, please do subscribe. It helps out the channel a lot. Also, if you want to play PSV format or any of the other formats that I feature on this channel, then definitely check out the Discord server. Link will be in the description down below. But it's a great place to find games in these obscure and underexplored formats. So check it out if you're interested. Also, as always, if you enjoy the video, please do leave a like down below. It helps a lot. But, you know, this is going to be a long video, so with that all the way, let's dive in. So... Pharaoh Servant released some incredibly powerful cards to the metagame that drastically changed the way the game is played. And PSV format sort of shows how powerful those new cards were and how game warping they were. But before diving into these new cards themselves, it's good to just get an idea of what the limited list was like at the time. So let's discuss that first. So this is the limited list for PSV format. It's the same limited list that was in jar format and treasure format. So, you know, this isn't in counting for the new cards in Tournament Pack 2 and in Pharaoh's Servant, which means that Morphing Jar is unlimited, as well as all the powerful cards that I'm going to be discussing today. But there are certain powerful cards in this format that are limited, and for good reason. So let's just discuss them really briefly. As a note, most of these cards will be pretty much applicable in most decks in this format. So if you're looking for good cards to build a deck around, you can't go wrong with including a lot of these in your deck. So to start off with, we've got the monsters. We've got Cyber Jar, which is a very powerful board clear and also just very good in like empty jar at digging deeper into the deck. So that's why this is limited. We've got all five pieces of Exodia, which probably aren't that powerful right now. They did get a new tool in Pharaoh's Servant that we'll discuss later. But really these are on here for the flavor, you know. They're each limited forbidden pieces that you combine to form the ultimate win condition. So it makes sense that they're all limited to one. Where you really start getting to the powerful cards is in the spells. We've got the Power 5 Limited Spells from Yugi, Kaiba, and Critter, Change of Heart, Dark Hole, Monster Reborn, Pot of Greed, and Raigeki, all insanely strong in their own ways. But we also have new cards for Magic Ruler making an appearance here. We've got the three hand rips, Confiscation, Delinquent Duo, and Forceful Sentry, all incredibly good. We have Painful Choice, which, you know, in the previous format, I don't think was that strong. I mean, it was very good in certain situations. But it wasn't sort of like an instant include in every deck. This format, I think that really changes, however, as there are a lot more ways to take advantage of the graveyard, which we'll be discussing relatively soon. We also have Snatch Deal, which is great at making big, aggressive pushes, taking an opponent's powerful monster and getting in for a ton of damage. And lastly, we've got Upstart Goblin, just to prevent decks from being too consistent. Uh, this card doesn't really see as much play as the other limited spells, but I think with more experimentation, it definitely could. The only limited trap in this format is Mirror Force, which, you know, is meant to stop big aggressive pushes, but this is a reflection of the fact that there aren't really too, too many really powerful traps before this set exactly. We'll be seeing some very powerful new traps as we discuss the rest of this guide, but for now, the limited list is only taking into account previous releases, and Mirror Force was easily the best of those traps, so that's why it's the only limited trap on this list. For these semi-limited monsters, we've got Sangan and Witch. These are incredibly good recruiters. Just being able to even just replace themselves with another Sangan or Witch is incredibly good at just keeping card advantage going and keeping board presence on field. 
So these are incredibly good, and they also get some very powerful new targets to search out in this format. We've got two card destruction here on the limited list. This is very good in things like Empty Jar, which is a contender in this format, as I'll discuss later. So that's why this is semi-limited, as, you know, Empty Jar is a bit of a nice strategy, but if given three of these, it could be a lot more degenerate than it already is. We've got two Heavy Storm. It's just good to have the threat of a massive board clear in this format. Although I will say, I think that of the spell and trap removal available in this format, this is actually one of the weaker options, which, you know, I'll discuss later on why I think this is. But it's just kind of interesting to see Heavy's place in this meta. And lastly, we've got two Swords of the Young Light. I think this card is really not very good anymore. There's a lot more powerful options to be used instead. But it's still on this list. I mean, it still is very good, even though there's a lot more spell and trap removal here. So you can play it if you're a stall deck. I just think there's better options now. As I mentioned, a lot of these cards will be relevant in a lot of decks. So a lot of decks will be playing, you know, the one-ofs here, as they are incredibly good. So keep that in mind as we're going through the discussion of the new cards and how they stack up to these old cards. But now that we've gotten this out of the way, let's dive in to the new cards that this set released and the new most powerful decks available. So I like to call this section core cards as I'll be discussing the most powerful cards released in this format. But you could also just view this section as like the core decks as most of these powerful cards just enable super powerful strategies that are very specific instead of being just generically good. So I'm just going to view this both a discussion of the best cards in the format and a discussion of the best decks in the format at the same time. And the main powerful card that is both a linchpin of its strategy and just generically good is Jinzo. Now, Jinzo is a level 6 monster, which means it does require a tribute to bring out from your hand, but it reads that trap cards and their effects on the field cannot be activated and negate all trap effects on the field. This is incredibly powerful if you're able to bring it out and go for an offensive push, as trap cards are really the only way in this format that you can interact with your opponent on their turn. Of course, you know, things like Mystical Space Typhoon or like Rush Recklessly, I guess, do exist, so there are some quick play spells. But the main way that your opponent is going to stop you from getting in damage is through traps. So if you've got Jinzo out, you've basically got a free ride to attack into your opponent's life points and potentially kill them. Now, I think because Jinzo is so prevalent in this format, in an OTK capacity, I've seen people start playing Karibos in their main deck, and I think that is a very good option that could potentially put a bit of a kibosh on what I think is the best deck in the format. But I think that Jinzo can easily form the linchpin of a strategy called Machine OTK that is incredibly powerful, even though Jinzo can be a bit hard to bring out. Now you might be wondering how Jinzo is the linchpin of the strategy if it is a level 6 monster that you normally have to tribute something to bring out. And the answer to this is the massive amounts of revival in this format. Of course, we've still got Monster Reborn from formats past, but Pharaoh Servant also introduced Premature Burial and Call of the Haunted. Now, Premature Burial is easily the weaker of the two, as, you know, it does lose to things like Mystical Space Typhoon, Dust Tornado, and also the new released Imperial Order, which I'll get to soon. But it still is pretty good in a pinch, and it can bring back Jinzo if it's in the graveyard. Now, you might think it's a bit of a hard task to actually get Jinzo in the graveyard, but there is one card in this format that makes it super easy, and that card is Painful Choice. Now, Painful Choice is a limited spell, so, like, you're not guaranteed to get it every game. But if you do draw it, you basically just wait on the spot. You can dump a ton of Jinzos from your deck to the graveyard. And if you've got any sort of graveyard recursion, like Premature Burial or Call of the Haunted, which we'll discuss soon, you know, you basically just have an OTK on field right away, or at least in a couple turns. Now, I will say one thing about Premature Burial, it does have a very neat interaction with Giant Trunade, which a lot of these machine OTK decks are playing, as it's a great way to clear your opponent's back row, but it can also be used to bounce back Premature Burial to hand. And Premature Burial, if it's bounced back to hand while its monster is still on the field, will actually keep that monster alive, it won't destroy it as it doesn't really have any clause on its effect that says that when this card is removed from the field, you destroy the monster. So you can really abuse this card by comparing it with a giant trunade, you know, getting it back to hand, and then being able to revive another monster from your graveyard. So it's very good in that regard. And that is a potential advantage that it can have on a Call of the Haunted, as Call of the Haunted is a continuous trap that basically does what Premature Burial does, except when it does leave the field, then it does destroy the monster. Now, 
there is a very easy way around this. If you call the haunted back a Jinzo, then call the haunted effect will be negated. So if it does return to hand off of something like a giant true nade, then it won't actually destroy the Jinzo as that part of its effect is negated. This can also be very good if your opponent does activate some spell and trap removal like a mystical space typhoon on one of your set back row and you chain call of the haunted to it you can get back a jinzo call of the haunted will be destroyed but its effect to destroy the jinzo will also be negated so call of the haunted and premature burial are both very powerful i think call of the haunted is a little bit more powerful because it is reactive and you can also sort of negate its destruction effect with the Jinzo, which makes it very versatile. But both of these cards can enable a lot of graveyard recursion, which means that if you can send the Jinzo to the graveyard, you've got the great setup for an OTK. Now, you might wonder how we're actually putting this OTK together, as, you know, Jinzo does have 2,400, which is a high amount, but, you know, your opponent will have 8,000, which is a fair bit to overcome. The answer to that comes in another card that Pharaoh Servant released, which is also incredibly powerful and is what makes this strategy a bit more niche, and that is Limiter Removal. Limiter Removal is a quick play spell that you can activate during the damage step that reads that you double the attack of all machine monsters you currently in control until the end of the turn, and then during the end phase you destroy those monsters. Now, this can clear your entire field if you've got a bunch of machine monsters, but if you're activating this card you probably don't care because you're winning the game anyways. If you've got Jinzo on field to negate your opponent's traps, then this just lines up the way for a limiter removal push, and you can get in a ton of damage. Limiter removal on just a Jinzo is already 4,800, but if you've also got another machine, like Mechanical Chaser, then that pushes you up over the 8,000 life point threshold. And if your opponent has no monsters on their field, that's just the end of the game. Limiter removal can also enable the play of other machine type monsters, like Cannon Soldier, which already did see play, but also other just vanilla machine monsters that have pretty good stats. Guardian of the Throne Room is the next highest attack on a level 4 lower machine monster at 1650 after Mechanical Chaser. So you can use this if you want to sort of get in even more damage and make your limiter removals online even more of the time. If you want an option that's a bit more searchable, as Guardian of the Throne Room stats are outside of both Sangin and Witch's Search Range, you can also play Overdrive, which is searchable by Witch of the Black Forest. However, you know, it's a bit of a minor distinction. Overdrive's got 1600 attack, Guardian Throne's got 1650. For the purposes of the OTK, they're basically the same. So, these powerful machines can combine with limited removal and all the graveyard recursion in the format to form the backbone of a brutally devastating OTK deck that is somewhat consistent. These cards would all get limited on the next limited list, so in the next format, this will become... It's still a very powerful deck, but a lot less of a threat. Uh, but in this format, it is just completely overpowering. And I actually do think it's the best deck in the format, although there is another contender for that title as well. As a note, you know, while I'm on the topic of Machine OTK and the Machine deck, Machines did get another tribal tool if they want to use it, and that tool is 7 completed. Now, I don't think that this is actually good, and I don't think it should be included in your standard Machine OTK deck, but if you want to get a bit janky with machines, then this is an equip spell that can equip to a machine-type monster and increase its attack by 700 or its defense by 700. You get to choose. Now, this is in general just worse than like an Act of Despair, as you generally just want to be getting aggressive with the machine deck. But it is an option if you want to use it. I guess the defensive aspect can come in handy sometimes. And if you're already maxed out on Axis of Despair, then that can be good. But ultimately, I think this card is just pretty bad. So I wouldn't recommend actually running this. As a note, the Machine OTK deck can also run a very interesting continuous trap in this format, which is DNA Surgery, which is a continuous trap that basically switches all face-up monsters to one specific type. So if you declare Machine, you can make all of your monsters Machine, which then pairs very well with Limiter Removal. I don't necessarily think that this is good in the deck either, but it is an option if you want to use it. We'll be discussing DNA Surgery a lot more as we go on in this video and dive into a lot more jank strategies, as there is a lot of fun stuff it enables. Of course, mentioning it now, this does play well in pretty much any tribal deck that you'd want, as if you're playing a field spell or an equip spell for a specific type, then this can turn all your monsters into that type. But I don't really think those decks are that good this format. So it's something that I'll mention, but not something that I recommend. As one last note while we are on the topic of Machine OTK, 
you can potentially play an anti-machine OTK strategy based around Umi, as Umi does debuff all machine type monsters on the field by 200, but ultimately this won't really affect the OTK itself. It would just be to sort of get over the individual monsters, and frankly, I don't really think it's that good. This strategy did have some legs back in like TP1 format, but I think it was sort of like rogue even then, and in this format, the power level is just so high that I think this strategy is blown out of the water and not really worth playing. Although, I will be discussing a bit more Umi Jank later in the video. Moving on to the actual good cards, we also have the release of another very powerful secret rare from Pharaoh Servant that also warps the game, and that is Imperial Order. Imperial Order is a continuous trap that reads, negate all spell effects on the field, and then once per turn during your standby phase, you can pay 700 life points to keep this card in the field, and if not, destroy this card. As a note, it was eroded later on in the card's history, which is why you're seeing a slightly different effect on the screen. But just note that at the time that Pharaoh's Servant released, this was an optional maintenance cost that if you didn't pay, you could send it to the graveyard, which does enable you to turn off Imperial Order when it would be inconvenient for you to have it on the field. Like if you want to make a big push with some spells, then you can shut off Imperial Order that way. Also, as another note, the way that maintenance cost works at this time in Yu-Gi-Oh's history is that if you do have something like a Jinzo on field negating the effect of Imperial Order, this will also enable you to not have to pay the maintenance cost to keep Imperial Order on the field while Jinzo's up. I'm pretty sure this would change later on in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, but this is how it works at this point in time. Imperial Order is a card that sees play in pretty much every deck this format, as it is probably the most busted card released in this set. Spell cards are easily still the most powerful cards in this format, and so just being able to shut them off when you want is just incredibly strong. And if you have a very good board position when you do this, your opponent could just have no way to actually deal with your monsters. So Imperial Order, pretty much a must play at three copies in every single deck in this format, and it is just completely game warping. Now there are some outs to it. If your opponent activates Imperial Order, you are able to actually chain Mystical Space Typhoon to it, as its effect to negate all spell effects on the field is not yet active, so you will actually be able to destroy it if you do chain a Mystical Space Typhoon to it. But if your opponent has another Imperial Order, they can shut off that line of attack. A card that might be able to deal with Imperial Order a little bit better is actually Dust Tornado. Now, Dust Tornado is basically Mystical Space Typhoon, but in the form of a trap card. It says target one spell or trap your opponent controls, destroy that target, then you can set one spell or trap card from your hand. Now, this second part of the effect doesn't really have much application. There are some niche things, like if your opponent activates a card destruction, you can chain Dust Tornado targeting the card destruction, set one spell or trap that you don't want to lose from your hand to the field, sort of get around it that way. Um, this doesn't usually come up, but it can come up, so it's good to mention. And also, as a note, like, if you do use this effect and you set a quick play spell, you can actually activate that the turn that you set it. Because at this time in yu gi history, you could activate quick play spells the turn that they are set. So, you know, it does have some interesting niche applications with the second part of its effect, but the main reason you're playing it is for the first part as this is a very good out to Imperial Order and any of the other very powerful sort of continuous traps or equip spells in the format. So I think that both of these cards are very, very good in a variety of decks and should see a lot of play. But getting back into the sort of more niche strategies that I think are incredibly good, there is one more sort of top contender in this format for best deck, and I think that is Empty Jar. Now, Empty Jar has access to a lot of tools in this format, but other decks also have access to a lot of hate for it, which does make it a bit tough to play. Uh, there are sort of ways around that hate, like Imperial Order can stop the spell hate that is very prevalent, and things like Dust Tornado or Mystical Space Typhoon can stop some of the like continuous trap hate for it. But I do think that Empty Jar is a bit worse off than Machine OTK in that regard. And also, you know, it is a bit more telegraphed than Machine OTK, but some of its tools are incredibly powerful enough that it might not even matter. So the new powerful tool that Empty Jar got is Morphing Jar number two. And this card is absolutely insane for the deck. Basically, when it's flipped face up, you shuffle all monsters on the field of the deck, then each player excavates cards from the top of their deck until they excavate the same number of monsters they shuffled in the deck, 
You special summon all level 4 lower monsters in face down defense position, and send the remaining cards to the graveyard. Now, if your opponent just doesn't hit any monsters until deep into their deck, you've milled them a ton of cards, and that could be enough just to deck them out the next turn, honestly, depending on what you've got. But this also is very good at stopping aggressive pressure. Cyberjar, up until this point, was like the premier way of doing that. But you could get the unlucky situation where your opponent would get some very powerful monsters off the Cyberjar and still be able to attack you while you drew no monsters yourself. Morphing Jar forcing the monsters that it brings out to be summoned in face down defense position is just very good at stopping these sorts of aggressive situations from happening. In addition, Cyber Jar could give your opponent some very powerful spells or traps to hand. Morphing Jar just sends them all to Grave, which is a very, very good application of it. I think this is probably the best monster in Empty Jar, and the best part about it is, is that if it's the only monster on your side of the field when it's attacked into, and it is going to be destroyed by this battle, it doesn't actually count itself for this effect, as it is already sort of like marked as being not on the field when damage calculation occurs and it's destroyed. So you won't actually be milling yourself. Now, of course, it also isn't bad if you just sort of flip this up on your own turn and get a monster from your deck to the field, but I think that, like, the fact that it's not really as reciprocal can be very, very good. And also makes it a card to consider playing in decks that are not Empty Jar. Uh, this is just very good at stopping any sort of aggressive pressure. If your opponent is going for a machine OTK push and they have to get over one of your set monsters, if that set monster is Morphing Jar, you can cut your opponent off from their aggressive push and set them back quite a bit. So I think this card is insane. I think that along with its predecessor, Morphing Jar, uh, I think both of these just make the Empty Jar deck just incredibly strong. And it goes to show why the deck is called Empty Jar, because these cards are just so dominant. However, as I mentioned, there is a lot of Empty Jar hate this format, and the main Empty Jar hate comes in the form of three cards that I think should probably see play in most side decks in some capacity. Firstly, we've got Nobleman of Crossout. Nobleman of Crossout is a spell card that says target one face down monster in the field, destroy that target, and if you do, banish it. Then, if it was a flip monster, each player reveals their main deck, banishes all cards from it with that monster's name. Now, at this time in the game's history, I'm pretty sure you didn't actually have to reveal your main deck to your opponent, but you would have to sort of go through and banish any flip monsters that had the same name as the monster. And of course, this hampers Empty Jar immensely, as if you're able to snipe something like a Morphing Jar number two, then your opponent won't have access to that card for the entire rest of the game, which can just be the death knell for their strategy. Nobleman can also just be good in other aggressive decks at just clearing the way for their monster to attack in. This card plays very well against something like a Sangain or a Witch, as up until this point, the only real ways that you had to remove such a card like that were by just destroying them, which would then get your opponent to search. Nobleman just cuts that off immediately, banishing their monster, preventing it from hitting the grave, and preventing your opponent from getting that search. So I do think that the card can also be used in other strategies, besides just sort of like an anti-empty jar measure. For cards that are a bit more targeted to empty jar, we've also got Light of Intervention. Light of Intervention is a continuous trap that basically prevents monsters from being set or flipped face down while it's on the field, which basically just stops empty jar in its tracks. Now, Empty Jar is likely playing some forms of spell and trap removal, so they are likely going to be able to have a way to out this, but if you are able to stick this on the field and prevent your opponent from setting, you know, they just might not have anything to do, and that might just be the end of the game. However, as I did say, you know, it is weak to spell and trap removal, but it's definitely a good side deck card if you want to use it. Lastly, for the Empty Jar Hate, we've got Ceasefire. Now, Ceasefire is a very flexible card that can also be used in burn strategies, but it basically reads, if a face-down defense position monster or an effect monster is on the field, change all face-down defense position monsters on the field to face-up defense position. Flip effect monsters are not activated at this time, and also inflict 500 damage to your opponent for each effect monster in the field. The key part of this is that flip monsters' effects are not activated this time, and it does flip them up which means that you this is basically another counter to any flip monsters that your opponent might have. It also deals damage to them, which gets you a bit closer to your damage win condition. So I think this is very good. It can see play in burn decks as it is a burn card as well. Although, you know, it's a bit harder to use in those decks as, you know, burn is generally more on the defensive than the offensive, so your opponent's less likely to have a face-down defense position monster on field, 
You could set one of your own, but if it's a flip monster, you'd have to waste its effect for the ceasefire. So I don't really think that this is as good, especially given that like a lot of other decks in the format are just playing vanilla beaters like Mechanical Chaser or Guardian of the Throne Room or Overdrive. So I think the ceasefire isn't the best here, but it does have some applications in a burn deck if you want to use it. The main reason to put it in a deck is sort of as an anti empty jar hate, and so it could be very good in the side deck for that reason. But these are the cards that I think are entirely format warping, or the cards that you should see play in pretty much every deck in the format. Of course, things like Empty Jar aren't necessarily going to play like Jinzo, Premature Burial, or Call of the Haunted, and non-machine OTK decks aren't going to play things like Limited Removal, but I did want to mention them here as they are so incredibly strong in this format, and Machine OTK is such a dominant deck. However, there are also some other sort of generically decent cards that I don't necessarily think should see play in every deck, but I think could see play in some decks, depending on how jank you want to make your builds. So let's discuss those now. I call this section the cards to consider, as I do think that it's worth considering putting these cards in your deck whenever you're deck building, depending on what directions you want to go in. The first of the cards that I want to discuss here is 4-star Ladybug of Doom. Now this is a flip monster that destroys all level 4 monsters your opponent controls, which can be good as sort of like an anti-beatdown strategy. Of course, it suffers from some major problems. Again, like I mentioned in the previous section, there is a lot of empty jar hate in this format, so if your opponent does know that you're playing a flip monster like this, they might side in to like their Nobleman's Crossout, or even something like Light of Intervention. So, I do think that this card does have some major flaws based on how the meta lines up right now. But it can be pretty good if you're able to pull off its effect and your opponent has a bunch of level 4 monsters on board. Of course, another flaw of this card is that it doesn't actually deal with something like a Jinzo, so it won't be able to cut off that sort of machine OTK push if your opponent is making that push. But I still think it's decent and at least a card to consider. Going from defensive to offensive, there are some other very powerful monsters that I think are worth discussing. Goblin Attack Force is a very interesting monster. It is now the new level 4 monster with the highest amount of attack in this format. And just like things like Gumo and Dark Elf, it does come with a downside. Basically, it reads that if this card attacked, it's changed to defense position at the end of the battle phase, and its battle position cannot be changed until the end of phase of your next turn. Which basically means that, you know, you can clear a monster on their side of the field or get in a ton of damage, but your opponent will be able to retaliate the next turn and potentially kill it if they've got a monster to get over it with. Of course, there are sorts of ways around this, things like Boboku, or some of the other stellar tactics that I'll mention later in this video can do this. But basically, the way I view Goblin Attack Force is basically like a Fisher. Uh, it's just able to clear pretty much whatever your opponent might have, except for something like a Jinzo. And it is searchable off of something like a Witch of the Black Forest. So, you know, I could see this seeing some play in some sort of niche decks. Another monster to consider that's searchable off Witch and is pretty aggressive is the Fiend Mega Cyber. Now, this is a level 6 monster, just like Jinzo, so it can be a bit difficult to bring out through normal means, but its effect can mitigate this somewhat. If your opponent controls at least 2 or more monsters than you do, you can special summon this card from your hand. So, you know, if you've just got a set witch on field, your opponent brings out 2 monsters, one to clear the witch, one to attack him directly, you can search out the Fiend and Mega Cyber, and that next turn special summon it from your hand, and also bring out an additional aggressive pressure if you've got it, and potentially clear their board and have a very aggressive setup of your own. So I do think it's kind of like a neat card. I think that it's not the best. I mean, it 2200 attack is very good, but it does lose to something like Goblin Attack Force, or even like a Jinzo. But it is a card to consider if you want to go a bit more jank here. And it is a very fun thing to drop this on your opponent if they're not expecting it. But this set didn't really have the most monsters that were generically useful here. So that's going to do it for those. Let's dive into the new spells that I think are worth discussing. And let's start off with Nobleman of Extermination. Now, this is basically another form of spell and trap removal, so if the three Mystical Space Typhoons, three Dust Tornadoes, and two Heavy Storms weren't enough for you, we've got more. Um, I don't necessarily think that you should necessarily have to play this because you've got the Dust Tornadoes, Mystical Space Typhoon, and Heavy Storm, but this does have some niches. So, it basically reads target one face down spell or trap card in the field, Destroy that target, and if you do, banish it. Then if it was a trap, each player reveals their main deck, then banishes all cards from it with that card's name. Now you might think that this is incredibly good at dealing with things like Call of the Haunted, 
or like even things like Woboku. But realistically, this card isn't actually the best. And the reason for this is that many traps that would see play in this format can actually be chained to it. And if the trap is not face down when this card is resolving, it won't actually destroy the trap or banish any other traps of the same name from the deck. So realistically, the only traps this card is going to be able to snipe is one of the traps that I'll discuss soon, like Enchanted Javelin, Majizure, or something like Trap Hole, um, which is a very valuable card to get rid of, I will admit. But I don't think that we'll see much play in this format, as there are just much more powerful cards to include instead. Or something like a counter trap that your opponent doesn't actually want to activate in response, something like Solemn Judgment. If your opponent's at 8,000 life points, they have a Solemn set, and you activate an Omen of Extermination. They could pay 4,000 to prevent them from losing the other Solemns in their deck if they're playing more. But honestly, you know, I don't think that's really worth it. So, Nomen of Extermination isn't the best at getting under traps. If your opponent does have a set spell, then it can easily destroy that, so that's nice. But honestly, I don't really think that this card is as good as the other spell and trap removal in this format. It is there if you want to use it, though. The other spell I want to talk about here is Prohibition. Now, I think this card is probably better in the side deck if you're going to play it at all. It's basically a continuous trap that reads... Declare one card name, cards with that name, and their effects cannot be used. Cards already in the field are not affected, including face down cards. So, if you know what your opponent is on, then you can potentially activate this and cut them off from some majorly powerful cards. For instance, if you know they're on Machine FTK, you can activate Prohibition, declare Jinzo, and that is incredibly hampering for the deck. So, you know, you could definitely include this in your side deck if you're going up against a more targeted deck and you want ways to cut off key plays that they may have. However, this does lose to something like an Imperial Order, so it's not the best in my opinion. Also, given all the spell and trap removal in this format, it's very easy for your opponent to clear. So, I don't personally think that this is the best, but it is a card to consider. While I'm talking about Prohibition, I will mention some more jank cards that I don't actually think are very good, but can pair like somewhat well with Prohibition, so I figure now's the time to mention them. Uh, these are all cards that can basically let you see what your opponent's got in hand. They all operate in somewhat different ways with their own cost associated with them. Firstly, we've got Respect Play, which is a continuous trap that says that during their respective terms, each player must show their opponent their hand. Now, this is great seeing what your opponent's got in hand, potentially using a prohibition to prevent them from using the most powerful cards there, but it does come with the major drawback of revealing what you've got in hand. One way around this is that you could activate during your opponent's turn, and then when they go to end their turn, you activate some like a mystical space typhoon to destroy this card and like prevent your opponent from seeing what you've got on the next turn. But I think overall, this card isn't really worth it. Uh, you're using one card for hand knowledge, but it doesn't really do anything beyond that. And, you know, if you want hand knowledge, the hand rips that give you that knowledge are probably worth more than showing your hand to your opponent. By a similar note, I don't think Eye of Truth is that good either, and this actually, I think, is a worse card than Respect Play. It reads that your opponent must keep their hand revealed, and that once per turn during your opponent's standby phase, if they have a spell in their hand, they gain a thousand life points. So... I don't think that this is that good because it's giving your opponents life points because they likely will have a spell in their hand, given that spells are the most powerful cards to play in this format. And also, just like Respect Play, you will get hand knowledge, but this won't actually get you anywhere to like do anything about it. So I don't really think it's worth playing, but it is another card to consider with Prohibition. And for the last of these sort of hand knowledge cards, we've got Inspection. Inspection is a continuous spell that says during your opponent's standby phase, you can randomly select one card in your opponent's hand and look at it for the cost of 500 life points. Now, as a note, this is not once per turn, so you can potentially pay as many life points as you want to see as many random cards in your opponent's hand as you want, which should feasibly eventually let you see their entire hand. Now, if they've got a duplicate of one card in their hand, then you will never know this, potentially, but you could potentially see their entire hand here. However, it will cost a bunch of life points to actually do this, and unlike Respect Play and Eye of Truth, you're only seeing one card at a time, so you'll never know if your opponent has a more threatening card in hand to play around more. So, I don't really think this is that good. Also, all of these cards died in Spell and Trap Removal, so given the prevalence of Spell and Trap Removal in this format, I don't really think they're worth playing, but they are good to know about. 
and some of them will actually have relevance in later formats as well. But we'll get to those when we get to those. Moving on to the traps for this format, firstly we've got Enchanted Javelin, which I don't think is the best, but it is basically like a Karibo in a way. Basically it says you select one attacking monster, gain life points equal to its attack. So if your opponent's attacking you directly, then this will just even out to basically doing you no damage. If your opponent's attacking one of your defensive monsters, this will gain you life points. But this card will not be effective against Machine OTK as much because they do have Jinzo, so they'll be able to negate it. Also, you do have to activate this before damage calculation, and your opponent can just activate limit removal in damage calculation, dodging around and chanting Javelin a little bit. So, I don't really think this card is that good, but it is a card to consider. It's not terrible, so you can play it if you want. The next trap I want to talk about is a very interesting one that I think could see potential play, and that's Magic Drain. Now, Magic Drain is basically like Magic Jammer, except instead of you having to discard a card to negate a spell effect, your opponent can actually discard a spell to negate Magic Drain's negation of that spell. So if they don't have a spell in hand, then this is basically free spell card negation, and that's very good. Unfortunately, if your opponent does have a spell in hand that they don't really value as much as the spell they're activating, they can just get around this card, and so it can easily backfire but it is a very interesting form of spell negation that you might want to consider, especially given how powerful limiter removal can be. It's good to just have as many ways to negate it as possible. The next card is a similarly decent card that you could potentially see using, and that's Michizure. Michizure is a card that reads, when a monster is sent from the field to your graveyard, even during the damage step, target one monster in the field and destroy it. So this card is basically just one for one removal, which can be pretty strong, you know? Uh, if your opponent attacks into one of your monsters, destroys it, then it, you can flip up Michizure, destroy one of their monsters. However, just like all the other traps on this list, it does lose to Jinzo, so not the best card in the world, but it is a card to potentially consider. Moving on to some continuous traps, we've got Mirror Wall. Now, Mirror Wall is a very interesting sort of battle trap that basically reads have the attack of your opponent's attacking monsters. And then once per turn during your standby phase, you either pay 2,000 life points or destroy this card, which is a pretty steep cost, but honestly, you don't need to keep this card around. You just have to use it when your opponent makes one attack to potentially, you know, force them to crash their monster into your more powerful monster, and that can be good enough. Now, of course, this does lose to Jinzo, but I do think it's pretty good. However, you can't actually activate this in the damage step, which means that your opponent can chain something like Dust Tornado or Mystical Space Typhoon to this card to destroy it and prevent its effect from actually going through, which does make it a little bad. Your opponent can also activate a limiter removal if they really want to, to get over your monster if the attacking monster is a machine. And of course, Jinzo does just prevent this from being useful. But besides all that, I do think that it is a decent option to maybe consider if you really want it, so that's why I'm mentioning it here. The other continuous trap I want to talk about in this section is Solemn Wishes. Now, Solemn Wishes is a continuous trap that basically says whenever you draw a card, you increase your life points by 500. So this means that every turn while it's on the field, you'll be gaining 500 life points, which can insulate you against an OTK push. It can also be a great side deck card against things like Burn, as they can have a really tough time diminishing your life points if you're gaining 500 every turn. So I think this is probably the best anti-burn tech that we've gotten in the game so far, and it does have applications outside of it as well. So I think this, this is a very good card to consider, at least in the side deck. And lastly, we've got Time Seal. Now Time Seal is a bit interesting, it just reads skip the draw phase of your opponent's next turn. So it is kind of like a win more card, like if your opponent's in a bad situation, then you want to flip up Time Seal to prevent them from drawing out to that situation. Uh, but it is pretty good. I mean, win more cards can be pretty decent. And given the general power level of cards in this format, you know, you might need to cut off that extra card just in order to keep your monsters on field and keep making aggressive pushes to kill your opponent the next turn. So I do think it's not bad. It can also bait out spell and trap removal. If your opponent activates like a mystical space defender or death tornado, you can just chain this, prevent them from getting a draw next turn and also waste spell and trap removal. So I do think that this is pretty decent. However, I think that the power level of pretty much every other card in the format does outclass this. Um, and I think that's a problem for pretty much all the cards in this section. But 
I do think these are cards to consider if you want to use them. We'll be covering more generic cards that I think are a bit less good than the cards on this list here. But before diving into those, I do want to discuss some of the more specific strategies in this format, as I do think it's a good idea to understand what sort of powerful new tools more specific strategies got before diving into more generic support. So let's discuss those now. Firstly, I have to discuss all the new tools that Stall got. And by Stall, I mainly mean Empty Jar, Burn, and Exodia. You know, you could play just a generic stall mill deck, preventing your opponent from attacking for like 40 turns, but that's really hard to do when Jinzo exists in the format. So these are the three stall decks I think could mainly see play. And they do have some just generically good cards to support them. Firstly, Gravity Bind. Great continuous trap, prevents level four or higher monsters from attacking. Very good, of course, does not stack up to a Jinzo. So eventually it'll probably be ineffectual. Also, if your opponents get spell and trap removal, it can, they can get out of it that way. But, you know, if your opponent doesn't have Jinzo on the field or any spell and trap removal, this can be good at shutting down the game. However, because Jinzo and spell and trap removal exists, I don't think it's the best, but it can be used in pretty much any of these decks to slow the game down, and it pretty much just outclasses swords. I mean, Sangan can attack under it, and some more jank cards later on can as well. But, for the most part, this will shut down any attacks that your opponents want to make, which is pretty good. Moving on to the Empty Jar support, of course we've got Morphing Jar number 2, which I mentioned earlier, but we've also got the Shallow Grave, which is a very interesting card. Spear Cretan sees a lot of play in Empty Jar decks, because it can revive your flip monsters in a way that they'll be able to activate their effects again, and Shallow Grave is basically that in a spell card. Each player targets one monster in their own graveyard, and they special summon the target from the graveyard and face down defense position. Now this time in the game, just like Spear Cretan, I'm pretty sure you could actually activate this when your opponent has no cards in the graveyard. So you can potentially get a one-sided sort of flip monster back to field, but realistically your opponent will have a monster in grave to revive. However, it might not be important enough to actually care about, especially if you're getting back something as powerful as a Morphing Jar number two. So Shallow Grave, very good for this. And another card that I think may fly under the radar for a lot of people, but actually has some very interesting applications in this deck is Magical Hats. And, you know, Magical Hats could have applications in other stall decks as well, as it sort of does buy you time in the battle phase. But there is a very funny interaction with Empty Jar that I want to talk about in particular. So, Magical Hats is a very strange card that basically reads, during your opponent's battle phase, you can choose two spell and traps from your deck and one monster in your main monster zone. Spell summon them as normal monsters in face down defense position. Set the chosen monster, shuffle them up on the field, so your opponent doesn't know which one is which. And at the end of the battle phase, if the spells and traps were not destroyed, then they are destroyed. So, you know, this can stall a bit, as it will basically form a defensive wall that your opponent will have to get through. But the more funny application of it is to basically just act as a way to flip back down a powerful flip monster into face down defense position. Now, of course, this doesn't really apply to something like a Morphing Jar number two, as if you're flipping this face up, it likely will be shuffled back into the deck, and so it won't stick around. But it can be used against something like a Ceasefire, you know? If your opponent Ceasefire to your Morphing Jar number two, you can Magical Hats it back to face down defense position. And it can be very good with something like a Morphing Jar, which I do think still does have a place in the Empty Jar deck. So, very neat card. I'm not sure exactly how good it will be in Empty Jar, but it is a tool that they've got, so something that I hope sees experimentation. Now, while I am discussing Empty Jar, I figure I might as well discuss some pretty jank Empty Jar hate. Uh, I discussed Nobleman, Light of Intervention, and Ceasefire earlier, but there are some other cards that sort of are targeted against decks that want to set cards face down. So, I figure I'll mention them here, even though they're not really supporting the deck, they're more against the deck, but they are kind of interesting. Firstly, we've got Bombardment Beetle, and this is a flip monster that basically says, pick up and see one face down defense position monster on your opponent's side of the field. If it's a defect monster, destroy it, and its flip effect is not activated. So, this is a pretty bad way of dealing with set monsters, as it does take time. But it can be a way to deal with them. Uh, if you really want to go in on the Empty Jar Heat, you could play this. I don't really think it's that good. But it's kind of funny if your opponent activates a Shallow Grave and you've got Bombardment Beetle in the graveyard, then that's kind of a hard counter. So kind of funny in that respect. We've also got the trap Shadow of Eyes. This card reads that when a monster is set on your opponent's field, target one of those set monsters, change that set monster to face up attack position, and flip effects are not activated. So this won't necessarily destroy your opponent's monster, and it can open you up to them activating like a Magical Hats if they've got it, but I think this card does have a niche as an anti-Empty Jar hate tool, 
But again, you'd only really want to use this card when you maxed out on your other anti-MTHR heat techs, and this card's just a little bit too situational, and requires your opponent not to have set up their flip monsters already. Now a bit of jank that I'll mention with the MTHR tools, because they do sort of facilitate it, are the continuous traps appropriate and force requisition. Now, force requisition is a lot less useful in this deck than appropriate for reasons that I'll get into shortly, but basically these are two very similar continuous traps. Appropriate says to activate only when your opponent draws a card outside of either draw phase. After that, each time your opponent draws a card outside of either draw phase, immediately draw two cards. Now you've got a lot of cards in empty jar that can actually trigger this. If you flip up like a morphing jar or activate card destruction, you can actually activate appropriate afterwards. And whenever you activate a morphing jar or card destruction afterwards, you will be able to draw two additional cards, potentially draw you deeper into your combo pieces. Now. I don't think that this is very consistent, but it is a potential option if you do want to just have a card that's constantly digging you deeper into your deck. Force Requisition is very similar. It's a continuous trap that you can only activate when you discard from your hand, and after that, each time you discard from your hand, your opponent must also discard the same number of cards from his or her hand. Now, the issue with this card is that there aren't actually many cards in this format that cause you to discard cards from your hand as the last thing that happens. And you can only activate this card when you discard cards from your hand as the last thing that happens. Something like card destruction or morphing jar, the last thing that happens is that you draw cards, so you won't be able to activate force requisition in response. Now, there are some ways around this. I'm pretty sure if you discard a thunder dragon and choose not to add anything to your hand, I think you'll be able to activate force requisition in response. I don't quite know, let me know down in the comments below if I'm incorrect about that. But the most surefire way that I know of triggering Force Requisition is the Cheerful Coffin. Uh, it's terrible, it's a discard up to three monster cards from your hand to the graveyard, so it's just a strict minus. But it is a card where the last thing that you're doing is discarding, so it does trigger Force Requisition. So I mean, if you really want to go for this card, you can trigger it that way. But I think that, you know, if you're going this sort of jank route with these continuous traps, the card that you'd like to use in Empty Jar is Appropriate. I don't think that either of these are very good, but they are options to use. And I didn't really have another place to talk about them in this video. Moving on to Burn, we've got some very interesting Burn tools. Firstly, we've got Burning Land, which is a continuous spell that basically destroys all field spells on the field, which is not really that important. But the important thing about this card is that during each player's standby phase, the turn player takes 500 damage. So this is basically a continuous burn spell that basically drops your opponent's life points down very steadily and can add up to them losing the game. Now, as I mentioned, Solemn Wishes is in this format, which does make this card a little bit less good. But if your opponent doesn't have that, then this can be pretty devastating. And even though it is reciprocal, there are some pretty cheeky ways that you can get around this. Of course, activating spell and trap card removal in your draw phase or during your opponent's end phase will get around it. But there's also an interesting trap called Solomon's Law Book that basically says skip your own standby phase. So if you activate this card during your draw phase, then uh, Burning Land won't deal you damage. I don't think it's very good. I think that you can afford to take 500 damage over playing a pretty much useless card. But it is an option if you are worried about that. The other new burn cards are a bit more interesting. We've got Skull Invitation, which says each time a card or cards is sent to the graveyard, inflict 300 damage to its owner for each card sent. So if you are able to get aggressive and send a bunch of your opponent's cards to grave, then you could potentially deal a fair amount of damage to them. However, I think this, this is a bit worse of a reciprocal card effect than something like Chain Energy for the burn deck, as burn is generally going to be sending more cards to its graveyard than the opponent is. So you're likely going to be taking more damage off this than your opponent will, but it is an interesting card to consider. Once you've got your opponent down to a pretty low threshold, you can also activate Minor Goblin Official, which is basically a card that you can only use when your opponent has 3,000 life points or less, and it inflicts 500 damage to your opponent during each of their standby phases. Now, this is kind of like Burning Land, except it doesn't die to Imperial Order, it dies to Jinzo. But I honestly think that this isn't very good, as if your opponent is below 3,000 life points, you could probably just kill them through other burn cards instead. But it is an interesting card to consider. Next up, we've got Attack and Receive, which is a card that you can only activate when you take damage to your life points, but it inflicts 700 points of damage to your opponent's life points. And if you've used up multiple other Attack and Receive, then it inflicts 300 points of damage on top of that for each one in your graveyard. So kind of an interesting card. You can kind of combo this with Painful Choice a little bit if you want to, 
Uh, but if you activate three attack and receives over the course of the game, and they're all in your graveyard then that does add up to a fair amount of damage. 3,000 damage total, I believe. Uh, double check my math if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that is what it adds up to. So that's nothing to shake a stick at. So definitely a card to consider playing in a burn deck. Lastly for burn, we've got type zero magic crusher, which reads discard one spell card from your hand to inflict 500 points of damage to your opponent's life points. Now there are some cheeky plays that you can make with this, like if you've got sort of deep seated, you can discard to grave, that will go back to the top of your deck, and then you'll draw it next turn to deal an additional 500. But honestly, I, I don't think that this is very good, as you know, it's costing you spell cards, which are the most powerful cards in the game, and most spell cards that you'd want to play in a burn deck just do more damage than this on base. So I don't really think this card's that good. It is an option that you can consider though. Just like I talked about some janky anti-mill tech in this section, I also want to talk about some more jank anti-burn tech in this section. Of course, Solemn Wishes is, in my opinion, the best anti-burn tech, but it does die to spawn trap removal, and these other cards don't, so you could consider playing them instead. First up, we've got Gift of the Mystical Elf, which increases your life points by 300 for each monster on the field. Now, this card has the obvious flaw of if there are a bunch of monsters on your side of the field, then your opponent just, just deserts you for more damage than Gift of the Mystical Elf actually gains you. But it's still a decent card at recovering some life points, especially if your opponent has a lot of monsters on the field. So it's something to consider if you want an anti-burn card in the side deck. I think the better anti-burn card, though, is probably Numinous Healer. Uh, still not as good as Solemn Wishes, in my opinion. But basically, when you activate this card, you gain 1,000 life points. And if you've used up multiple, just like with attack and receive, it gains you additional life points. So you gain 500 additional life points for each Numinous Healer in your graveyard as well, which will add to a pretty high total of 4,500 life points total gained, which is pretty good against a burn deck. So I think this card is pretty decent if you want to play it, but you should probably play three copies of it on the side if you do want to play it. Lastly, we've got Reign of Mercy, which is a spell card that increases the life points of both players by 1,000 points, which does give your opponent back some life points, to be fair. But if you're playing against Burn, you mainly care about your own life points. So I do think this could be a good card to include. Moving on to the last stall strategy we've got, we've got Exodia. And they did receive one piece of support outside of the generic stall support here, and that is Backup Soldier. Backup Soldier reads that while there are five or more monsters in your graveyard, you can target up to three non-effect monsters with 1,500 or less attack in your graveyard and add them to your hand. Which means that if you use something like a Painful Choice and send a bunch of the normal Exodia pieces to grave, you can get them back with Backup Soldier, which is pretty nice and actually increases the consistency of the deck quite a bit. It also shores up one of the deck's biggest weaknesses, which is that if your opponent does have like a hand rip card and they snipe out something like a arm or a leg of Exodia, then you can actually have a way to get it back now. However, it won't be able to get back the head of Exodia as that is an effect monster. So if you do lose that card, you are still pretty much dead in the water, but it does make Exodia a little bit more playable than it has been in past formats. So, you know, it's something to consider. I don't think Exodia is good in this format, especially given that Empty Jar is, in my opinion, the best stall deck in this format. But it is a way to make Exodia slightly more viable. But this set also released some interesting tools for some more aggressive jank strategies. So let's dive into those now. You know this is going to be a good section when I open up by starting about Parasite Parasite. Now, this is an iconic anime card that Weevil used against Joey. But... In the game itself, it's actually pretty bad. So it's a flip monster that says shuffle this face-up card into your opponent's deck, and then if they draw it after it was added to their deck, then it gets special summon in defense position, and they take a thousand damage. Then all monsters controlled by the player that summoned this card become insect monsters. So kind of anti-machino DK tech, I guess, uh, as they won't be able to activate limiter removals. But the main reason why it wants to switch your opponent's monsters to insects is to pair with a card called Insect Barrier. That is a continuous spell that is the bane of a lot of progression series. And it reads that insect type monsters your opponent control cannot declare an attack. So paired with something like Parasite Parasite, this will prevent your opponent's monsters from attacking. It has a much more straightforward combo if you pair it with DNA Surgery, just calling Insect, which is likely what you'll see used if you actually do encounter Insect Barrier in the format. 
But I think that using two continuous spell traps is asking for trouble in a format when so much spell and trap removal is running around. But it is a pretty jank strategy that you can use to saw your opponent out if you want to. I should also mention Drillbug here. It's an insect type monster that when it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you can select one Parasite Parasite card from your deck and place it on top of the deck. So this can make the Parasite Parasite combo more consistent, I guess. But Drill Bike has such low attack that it likely isn't going to be getting in to inflict battle damage. And you're also basically draw locking yourself into a Parasite Parasite. So not a very useful card to put on top of your deck. And not a very useful monster to actually include in the deck at all. So I think that this whole combo is pretty bad. And it's just there because the anime featured it. There is one additional card that this set released that does pair with an insect deck if you do want to make one, and that's Insect Imitation. It says Tribute 1 Monster, Special Summon 1 Insect Monster from your deck whose level is 1 higher than the Tribute Monster it had on the field. Now, you could use this as an excuse to make a dedicated insect deck, but frankly there aren't many good insects in the format. Uh, there's Jirai Gumo, which is an insect uh, that you can tribute off something like a Sangan for to bring out with Insect Imitation. There's also Gurochin Kuwagata as the insect monster with the highest attack in this format that you could also bring off of Sangan if you don't want the life point cost associated with Gumo. But Kuwagata is really bad at only 1700 attack. I mean, I guess when paired with a forest or a laser cannon armor, it does get up over a mechanical chaser. But like, I think that's a bit cope. I think if you're going to be playing insect imitation, then you really just want to play it in a deck that's running Jirai Gumo and no other insects as just a way to fetch out Jirai Gumo. But even then, it's just a little bit too situational as you do need a level 3 monster. And the main level 3 monster you're going to be using is Sangan, which is semi-limited. Not impossible to build a deck around. There are some other good level 3 monsters like Giant Soldier Stone. But it's definitely a bit hard. And when you've got Witch of the Black Forest to two copies, able to search out Jirai Gumo anyways, it becomes a bit less useful. Moving on to the next jank strategy straight out of the anime, we've got Umi again. I mentioned earlier that I was going to come back to this and that time is now. Umi itself has not changed, but this set released some very interesting monsters to pair with it that actually have some anti-synergy with Umi, which is very interesting to see. The first of these is the Legendary Fisherman. This card reads that while Umi is on the field, it's unaffected by spell effects and can't be targeted for attacks, but your opponent can still attack you directly. So. This won't stop something like Machine OTK push. Now, the not being affected by spells is kind of nice, as, you know, it won't be affected by, like, Raigeki or Dark Hole or, like, Snatch Steel or any of the other powerful spells in this format. However, it's also not affected by Umi, so it won't actually gain anything from Umi's buff. I mean, it's a warrior-type monster anyway, so it wouldn't have anyways, but, like... You know, this card isn't affected by your own spells, and with only 1850 attack on a level 5 monster, it isn't really that good. Um, I mean, I guess it does crash with Mechanical Chaser, but I don't really think that that's worth sacrificing one of your own monsters and also presumably playing Umi to pair with it. So I don't really think this is that good. But somehow Pharaoh Servant managed to print a card that's just strictly worse, and that is Deep Sea Warrior. Now, Deep Sea Warrior has basically the same effect as Legendary Fisherman. As long as Umi is face up on the field, it's unaffected by spell cards, but it doesn't have its effect to avoid battle, because I think that this card was meant to be sort of like a more defensive option. It's got 1600 attack and 1800 defense, so presumably you could like set it, and, you know, your opponent can't get over it except with a mechanical chaser. So, I guess there's that. But, honestly, I'd rather prefer the offensive tool of Legendary Fisherman than the defensive tool of Deep Sea Warrior. Especially because Nobleman of Crossroads can still get rid of it while it's face down on the field. And that's not able to use its effect. So, all in all, I don't think these tribute monsters are worth it. And are just here to enable people to play sort of a fun sort of anime jank deck. Moving on to a jank strategy that is a bit better in my opinion. I mean, not great, but like slightly better. We've got Relinquished actually getting a new tool. And I think Relinquished was one of the good jank decks of the last couple formats. Just, it's got a really neat ability and there's so many sort of searchers for the ritual tools like Senju of the Thousand Hands that enable you to deck thin while you're also getting your combo pieces to hand. So that's pretty nice. But this deck actually received a new piece of support that's not actually ritual related. It's actually a fusion monster. Thousand Eyes Restrict. 
Now, this fusion monster is pretty powerful and will come to dominate later formats. If you're familiar with GOAT, you know what I mean. But here, it's a bit less good. It's a fusion monster made out of Relinquished and a card called Thousand Eyes Idol, which is just a normal monster with zero attack and zero defense. And Thousand Eyes Restrict reads that other monsters in the field cannot change their battle positions or attack, and that once per turn, you can target one monster your opponent controls. Equip that target to this card. This card's attack and defense becomes equal to that equipped monsters. If this card would be destroyed by battle, destroy that equipped monster instead. Now, this is a bit more of a lockdown effect than something like Relinquished is, so it can be useful in that regard. But there are a lot less ways to abuse Thousand Eyes Restrict than there are in later formats, and also it's a lot harder to bring out. You need to hard fusion summon it with Polymerization, Thousand Eyes Idol, and Relinquish. And while there are many ways to search out both of these cards, saying in which will both do it, and Relinquish can be searched with something like a Sentry with a Thousand Hands, the payoff doesn't really seem that much better than Relinquish at this point in time, at least to me. So... I don't really think it's worth playing, but it is an option if you want to try and hard fusion summoning Thousand Eyes Restrict before it actually becomes a viable card in a bunch of strategies. Moving on to some monsters that you can sort of build jank strategies around on their own. Firstly, we've got Hayabusa Knight. Hayabusa Knight is a level 3 monster with a thousand attack that can make a second attack during each battle phase. Now, this may not seem good since it's only got a thousand attack, but if your opponent doesn't have any monsters in the field, this can get in 2,000 points of damage, which is pretty decent. And if you actually equip this card with something like a Megamorph or Axe of Despair, or even use some like Earth Tribal through things like Gaia Power, this can actually add up to a fair amount of damage. You know, it's a bit hard to actually construct an OTK with this card at this point, but it is still a card that you can try building this sort of jank OTK style of deck around uh, with things like Equip Spells and Hayabusa Knight. So, card to consider. I don't think it's that good right now, but something you can build around. Speaking of other build-around monsters, we've also got some very interesting boss monsters of this format. The first being Sword Hunter. Sword Hunter is a level 7 monster that when it destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you can equip the monster destroyed to it, and it gains 200 attack for each monster equipped to it. Now, this is not a very good monster, as it requires a lot of setup to actually bring out, but just like with Jinzo, you can painful choice it to the graveyard and then bring it back with stuff like Call of the Haunted Premature Burial. And it can actually add up to a high amount of attack here. Now, whether that minor attack boost is good enough to merit play over something like a Jinzo, which actually has a very useful effect on top of it, is up for debate. Uh, but it is an interesting sort of boss monster that you can build around. So I figured I'd mention it here. Another boss monster that you can build around that's more related to the anime is Buster Blader. Now, this is a monster with 2600 attack on a level 7 monster. That reads that it gains 500 attack for each dragon monster your opponent controls or is in their graveyard. Now, dragon decks are not very good at this point in time. They haven't been good for quite some time. And they didn't really receive any tools to help them out here either. But... You can pair Buster Blader with something like a DNA Surgery to get its attack buffed up pretty high if you declare Dragon. Now, with 2600 attack on its own, I don't really think you necessarily need this buff, but it is an interesting deck you can sort of build around, and I'm sure you could try constructing some sort of way to get the maximum use out of a Buster Blader and a DNA Surgery. I don't think it's that good, but it is an option. So, kind of a fun thing to play around with. The sort of advent of all this graveyard recursion being unlimited does make these sort of big boss monster strategies slightly more viable, even if they're not really that good. So I figured I'd mention them here. But that's going to do it for the sort of tools given to these jank sort of strategies. However, Pharaoh Servant did include a bunch more generic cards that I do want to talk about. And while I've talked about the cards that I think are meta warpingly good, and the cards that are decent but probably won't see much play, there are also two categories below that, one being cards that are like, meh, like, you know, you could play them, I guess, but they're just not very good, and one class being cards that just make you think, why did Konami ever print these things? So let's dive into the mech category now. Okay, to start off the mech category, we've got Bite Shoes, which is a very interesting flip effect monster. When you flip face up, you change the battle position of one face up monster on the field. Now this can be like kind of decent at preventing a big OTK push. If your opponent attacks into Bite Shoes with one monster, you can switch another to defense. So that's not bad, 
But like, there's just so many other cards that are better in this regard. So I don't really think there's any real reason to play Bite Shoes, unless you have a personal attachment to the card. I guess you could potentially play this in like Clown Control, as you could target one of your own clowns and get a pop off. But like, I don't know, that just seems kind of convoluted and not really worth doing. And Clown Control is not very good in this format despite having tools like Gravity Bind introduced. Moving on to another flip monster, we've got Bubonic Vermin. Now, Bubonic Vermin is very interesting. When it's flipped face up, you can special summon another Bubonic Vermin from your deck in face down defense position, then shuffle your deck. Now, this is sort of interesting. It's kind of like Giant Germ and Nimble Manga in that it gets other copies of itself out from the deck. So that helps with deck thinning and also defensive presence. But unlike Giant German and Nimble Manga, it doesn't actually do anything on top of bringing out another monster from your deck. So I don't really think it's that good. I mean, if you really want deck thinning with like a slight defensive presence, you can play it. But I just think that you should play Giant Germ and Nimble Manga instead. I mean, I just think they're strictly better. Moving on to a bit more aggressive of a monster, we've got Gearfried the Iron Knight, which is a warrior type monster with 1800 attack that reads if either player equips an equipped card to this card, destroy that equipped card. So, you know, 1800 tech isn't bad. It doesn't beat a mechanical chaser, but beats pretty much everything else. And this is a beater that can't actually be snatch sealed, so that's kind of nice. However, snatch seal is limited, so there's only one copy of it allowed in each deck. And so I don't really think it's something that you really have to play around by playing Gear Freed, especially given that there's a lot of spawn trap removal that you can use instead. So I don't really think it's that worth playing, but it is somewhat interesting, I guess. It does also play a bit around the next card that I'm going to talk about, which is Kisei Tai. Now, Kisei Tai is very interesting. When your opponent attacks it while it's in face-down defense position, you equip it to that monster, and then during each of your opponent's standby phases, you gain life points equal to half of the attack of the equipped monster. Now, again, there's a lot of spell and trap removal in this format, so I don't think this is that good, especially given that you have to wait a fair bit in order to actually gain the life points. But, you know, it is a card that you can use as a bit of an anti-burn tech, I guess. Um, again, I don't really think it's that good. And it doesn't even match up well against Gearfreed, as Gearfreed will destroy it when it tries to equip to it. So, if you're worried about Gearfreed, you definitely shouldn't play this card, but you really shouldn't play this card in general, as they're just better anti-burn techs. Moving on to the spells, we've got a card that will become very powerful later on, which is Cold Wave. Here, though, it's a bit less good. Gold Wave reads that it can only be activated at the start of your main phase 1, and that until the next turn, you and your opponent cannot play or set any spells or traps. So this can help you out if you do want to make an OTK push, but the main way that OTK pushes are made in this format are through, like, activating limiter removal. So it kind of conflicts with that, and if you've got Jinzo on the field, your opponent can't activate traps in response to it anyways, so I don't really think Cold Wave is that good in Machine OTK. It can be potentially good in Empty Jar. You know, you open up with this, you activate it, set a monster face down. Your opponent can't use something like a Nobleman or a Light of Intervention. And also, you know, they'll have to keep their spells and traps in hand to potentially get discarded off of something like a Morphing Jar. So it can be good in Empty Jar, I will admit. But I think overall, this card is just not really worth playing in most decks. It will get very good later on in the game's history, though. Moving on to the other spell we've got in this section, we've got Fairy Meteor Crush, which is an equipped spell that lets monsters equipped with it deal piercing battle damage if they attack a defense position monster. This isn't bad, I guess, but I just think there are other equip spells that could get you more value. I guess if you've got a powerful monster on field, your opponent will likely be setting monsters in response to that, so this will enable you to get in extra damage, but you could just do that by summoning out a monster and attacking in after you've cleared whatever defense position monsters your opponent's got. So, I don't really think that this is the best, but it is an option that you can use. Moving on to the traps, we've got Light Force Sword, which is kind of one for one removal. Basically, it says banish one random card from your opponent's hand face down, and then during your opponent's fourth standby phase after this card activation, return that card to their hand. So you're basically depriving them of one random card from their hand, which isn't terrible, I guess, but like, there are so many other cards that you could use here instead. They can actually have more targeted removal instead of just being a random choice. So I feel like you should just play those instead. Not terrible though, so you could play this if you want to, I guess. And lastly, we have Shift. Shift is a trap that says when your opponent targets exactly one monster you control for an attack or with a spell or trap effect, target another monster you control that would be an appropriate target and that attack, spell, trap now targets the new target. Now, the issue with this is that there aren't actually too many powerful cards in this format that target. 
Change Heart and Snap Steel are the main ones, but pretty much everything else is non-targeting. Uh, I guess in Empty Jar this can be good again because Nobleman of Crosser does target, but you're still losing a face down set monster either way. And one of the big flaws with this is that it actually requires you to have your board set up already with more than one monster on field. So like, I, I don't know, it just requires too much to go right for you. And it's only really effective on certain very specific cards that are really powerful to be fair, but I don't think are worth actually playing this over something like a magic jammer or something like that. So I don't know. I don't really think that this card is that good. It can be used very funnily with Gear Freed the Iron Knight. If your opponent tries activating Snatch Fuel on another monster, you can shift it to the Gear Freed, but you can just use Taylor the Fickle for that instead. So I don't know. I don't think that shift is that good, but it is a card you can potentially play. That's going to do it for the Met tier. I mean, there weren't many cards in this tier, but I didn't think that these cards were good enough to talk about in like the cards to consider section. And I definitely don't think they're as bad as the cards that are to come. So let's discuss those cards now. This is the section of the video that I like to call why. Because looking at these cards, you just wonder why did Konami print these things? These are just really, really bad. So to start off with, let's talk about Invitation to a Dark Sleep. It's a level five monster with 1500 attack, 1800 defense. And when it's summoned, excluding special summon, select one of your opponent's monsters. As long as this card remains face up on the field, the selected monster cannot attack. Now, I've mentioned a lot of tribute monsters in this video up to this point, and I think that those monsters can be good because you can revive them from the graveyard so easily. However, Invitation to a Dark Sleep, you can't even revive from the graveyard really effectively because the only reason you'd play this card is for its, like, lockdown ability, kind of, but you have to tribute summon it to do that. And it only works while it's face up on the field. So if your opponent has another monster with 1500 or more attack, they can just get over it and attack with the first monster that you targeted. So, I mean, this card is just really bad. There are so many ways around it and it just doesn't really do enough to make it worth playing. It is searchable off Sangan, I guess. So there's that. I don't know. I really think that this card is abjectly terrible. And I can't really think of a strategy that would actually want to use this. Moving on to a slightly better card, we've got Mad Sword Beast. This is a 1400 attack point monster that basically does piercing if it inflicts battle damage. Maybe this card should have been in the mech category as this isn't that bad. It's kind of like Fairy Meteor Crush. But frankly, it's got such low attack for its effect that it doesn't really make it worth it. I guess you could go for an equip strategy, buffing this card up with things like Axe of Despair and the like. But if you're doing that, why not just play Fairy Meteor Crush with a better monster, you know? Uh, so I don't really think that this card is that good. It is interesting though. I guess it can be brought out off of Giant Rat. And it is a dinosaur, so that's fun. Not many good ones of those, but I don't think this necessarily breaks that trend. Moving on to the last monster in this category, we've got Vampire Baby, which is absolutely terrible. I mean, this is probably the worst monster in this set. Maybe Invitation to a Dark Sleep is worse, but Vampire Baby is pretty bad. This card reads that at the end of the battle phase, if this card destroys a monster by battle, send it to the graveyard this turn, you can special summon that monster to your side of the field. Now, with 700 attack, the only monsters that this is reasonably getting over are things like Sangan, which you actively don't want to summon back to the field as your opponent can get another search off of it if they destroy it again. Flip monsters, which are just useless if you special summon them to your field face up. Or, I guess, Goblin Attack Force. So, realistically, the only way this card is going to get good value is if you attack over a goblin attack force. You can also buff this card up with equip spells. That is true. But you'd have to use more than two to actually get this card to any reasonable amount of attack because the of Despair only brings this up to 1700, which can't even be a mechanical chaser. So realistically, you're never going to actually be getting a useful monster off of this card. And this card is just absolutely terrible. Like, even if you do invest resources into this to actually get it to a point where it can attack over an actual useful monster, you would have been better off just playing that monster in your own deck and just bringing it out without going through the vampire baby combo. I guess it does deprive your opponent of a Call of the Haunted or Premature Burial target, but I, this card is just abjectly terrible. Don't play it. Very, very bad. Moving on to some very bad spells, we've got Dimension Hole which is a bit interesting, I guess. Read select one monster on your side of the field and banish it until your next standby phase. 
While the monster is removed from play, the monster card zone of the select monster cannot be used. Seems like an unnecessary restriction on a already terrible card, but this card does have some applications, I guess. For instance, if you've got Dark Hole in hand, you can activate Dimension Hole to protect one of your monsters on the field, Dark Hole the board away, and then get that monster back next turn. Or if you anticipate that your opponent's got some form of like Raigeki or something, you can use this to prevent your monster from getting Raigeki done the next turn. But the fact that this card is not reactive makes this card pretty bad. Like if this was a quick play spell, that would be one thing, as you could chain it to your opponent's removal and preserve a monster that way. But given that it's just a normal spell card, there's just so little applications to this that it really just isn't worth playing over just better cards that can prevent destruction in other ways. Continuing the theme of monster zone removal, we've got ground claps, which reads like two main monster zones on the field. Neither player can use the selected zones. You cannot select a zone that is occupied by a monster card. So, you know, this card can be decent. If you actually have three of it, you can lock down your opponent's entire monster zones because you can activate two targeting two each of your opponent's monster zones, then activate a third targeting one of your opponent's and one of yours. But that requires three of this card. And again, with all the spell and trap card removal in the format, this becomes very fragile. So I don't really think this is that good as being used at one copy, you're basically restricting your opponent from having more than three monsters on field at a time. But frankly, that's all they need, especially if they're playing something like Machine OTK. So I don't really think this has much use in this format, but in later formats, it may find a niche. Moving on to probably the worst spell in this format, in my opinion, we've got Monster Recovery. Now, this is one of the most confusing cards in the game in my opinion. Basically, it reads, target one monster you control that is owned by you. If that monster is still on the field, shuffle it and your entire hand into the deck. Also, after that, draw cards equal to the number of cards you shuffled from your hand into your deck by this effect. You cannot activate this card if you have a card in your hand that is owned by your opponent. That doesn't matter as there's no real way to do that in this format yet. But what does matter is, is that this is basically like the quick play version of Dimension Hole, except you don't actually get the monster back. It just goes into your deck. And in addition, you lose whatever hand you have. So I guess if you want to get rid of your hand and draw a new one, so that's kind of decent, but you're losing a monster on field either way, so it's not really protecting against removal, and you're just making it more hard to access. So I think this card is really terrible and should basically see no play as I can't really see any reason why you'd actually want to use this card. I mean, I guess maybe for like an Exodia deck, if you've got a piece on field and you don't want it to get destroyed, but that is like really pushing the boundaries of believability for a game state that would actually occur. So I think this card is pretty terrible and shouldn't really see play. A card that's slightly better, but probably still shouldn't see play, it's Chain Destruction. This card reads, when a monster with 2,000 less attack is summoned, target one of them, destroy all cards with that name in its controller's hand and main deck. So, this card is interesting. It doesn't actually deal with the monster that's summoned onto the field, but it can prevent your opponent from getting more later on in the game. However, this has a major flaw, as there is so much graveyard revival in this format that actually sending those monsters to grave can help out your opponent instead of hurting them. So I don't really think this is that good. I guess for like a Witcher of Sand game, it could be decent at getting one copy of that out of the deck, but like, I don't really think it's worth playing, especially given that those cards are semi-limited. This this card is just pretty bad. I mean, I guess against Empty Jar, it can be nice if your opponent flips up a monster on their own, uh, but I mean, even then it's just kind of iffy. So I don't really think this does enough to be worth playing, even though it did have an epic anime moment. Moving on to two cards that are very similar to one that I've already talked about, we've got Gust and Driving Snow. These cards are both very similar to Michizure, except a lot worse. Gust basically reads that you can activate this card if one or more of your spell cards are destroyed and sent from the field of the graveyard by a card effect your opponent controls. You get to destroy one spell or trap on the field. And Driving Snow basically reads the same thing, but it triggers when one or more of your traps are destroyed. So these are basically like Michizure in that they trigger when one of your cards is sent to the graveyard and you get to sort of get a reciprocal card that your opponent controls. But these are a lot worse as there's just much better spell and trap removal in this format and they're, they're just way too conditional. Yes, when these sorts of things do go off, they can be kind of nice, but like realistically, 
these cards are just outclassed by Dust Tornado and Mystical Space Typhoon. And you want to be able to have the flexibility to activate them whenever instead of being tied to a condition. So these cards are not very good. Moving on to our next trap, we've got Earthshaker, which reads select two monster card attributes. Your opponent then selects one of the two attributes and destroys all face-up monsters with that attribute on the field. Now, in order for this to actually be useful, your opponent has to be playing multiple cards with different attributes, and they have to be pretty much equally good to make it actually a painful choice for your opponent. Unfortunately, most decks don't really play multiple attributes. I mean, dark monsters are pretty much the name of the game and are all extremely powerful. And just like the good stuff decks do just play a ton of dark monsters. The main deck that I can think about that would actually care about this, that plays more types than just dark is like Clown Control. But I think that Clown Control isn't very good in this format, so there's no real need to have a card specifically sided against it. And even then, your opponent can just always pick the more advantageous attribute to send. So I don't think that this card's that good. It's very interesting to think about, though. Moving on, we've got Gamble. Gamble's a very funny card, but I don't really think it's that good. You can activate this card when your opponent's hand is six or more and your hand is two or less. You toss a coin, call heads or tails, and if you call it right, draw until your hand has five cards. But if you call it wrong, you skip your next turn. So... If you skip your next turn, you basically lose the game, especially if your opponent's got six cards in hand. Uh, I, I guess it's good that you draw until you've got five cards. It can be a major plus for you. But given that the condition is already hard enough to fulfill and that, you know, the downside is so devastating for you, I really don't think that this card is that good. Although it is very funny if you're able to pull it off. Next up, we've got Grave Robber, which is a very interesting card. You get to select one spell card from your opponent's graveyard, and you can use it until the end of the turn. And if you do use it, you take 2,000 points of damage. Now, there's a lot of things about this card that I'm not quite certain of how they work in this format. For instance, if you activate Grave Robber, can you then discard the spell off of something? Like, if you use Magic Jammer, can you discard that for cost? Unclear. Uh... What I do know is that this card is bad enough that those sorts of ruling questions won't really matter. As while your opponent does likely have some very powerful spells in Grave, uh, if you use them, the cost is extremely steep. And in addition with three Imperial Orders in the format, it's just a bit too risky to actually use this card. Very interesting card though, I will admit. Uh, I'm happy to see these sorts of unique card effects, but... I just don't think that this is good enough to see any play. Next up, we've got Infinite Dismissal, which is a continuous trap that reads, level three or lower monsters are destroyed during the end phase of the turn they are normal or flip summoned. Which, you know, I it's not really that good. Um, there aren't really many level three monsters that your opponent would actually be normal or flip summoning, besides like Sangan. And with that, you don't want that to be destroyed because your opponent will get a search. So this card is just pretty bad. Uh, I can't really think of a good application for it. I guess against Clown Control, it destroys Dream Clown, but like, again, just like I mentioned for Earthshaker, you don't really have to have an anti-Clown Control card in your side deck, so not very good, but very interesting card, just like Earthshaker. The next four cards are all extremely similar and extremely bad. They're Armored Glass, Metal Detector, Mystic Probe, and World Suppression. And they can each be activated when a certain type of card is activated. Armored Glass is Equip Cards, Metal Detector is Continuous Traps, Mystic Probe is Continuous Spells, and World Suppression is Field Spells. Each one says to negate the effects of those cards. World Suppression is an outlier here, as it only negates the effect of this Field Spell that was activated this turn. However, given at this time in the game, you know, if you activate a Field Spell, it destroys your opponent's Field Spell. This effectively reads negate all field spells on the field. So I don't think that these cards are that good because the cards that they're negating will come back online the next turn. And also you could just be using like a Dust Tornado or a Mystical Space Typhoon or something like that. As each of these cards can be destroyed with those sorts of spell and trap removal tools. So these cards all pretty bad, but kind of neat that they're all sort of related in this way. The last card in this Y category is Regulation of Tribe. This is a continuous trap that says declare one type of monster, monster of the declared type cannot attack, and you must tribute one monster from your side of the field during each of your standby phases, and if you don't, this card is destroyed. This is interesting against tribal strategies, but 
realistically, you're not going to be able to use this effectively, as the main tribal strategy that you want to stop is Machine OTK, but Jinzo can just put a nail in this card's coffin. So this card is objectively terrible, just like pretty much all the cards in this section. So I got most of the way through editing this video, and I realized that I had actually forgotten to talk about a card from this set, which is Major Riot. Now, this is a pretty terrible card, so it's not surprising that I didn't include it, but basically this card is a trap card that says you can activate it when one or more of your monsters are returned from the field to your hand by your opponent's card effect. You can then return all monster cards in the field to your respective hands, and then both you and your opponent special summon from your hand the same number of monsters in face-down defense position. Now, this is never going to come up in this format, because as far as I know, the only card that can return cards to the hand is Hain Hain, which never sees play because it's really bad, but you know, for the sake of completeness, I figured I'd talk about it now, even though this card will never, never pop up in this format. But now that I've discussed all the cards in this format, we should talk about some deck lists just to get an idea of what the major decks in the format are. So let's start by talking about what I think is the best deck in the format, Machine OTK. Now, of course, this is a very preliminary sort of list. I haven't done too much testing with this, but I think Machine OTK is the best deck in the format. And however you want to build it, it is very strong. Just being able to get back Jinzos from the graveyard very easily off of things like Call of the Haunted or Premature Burials is very good. You might not need three Jinzos, and in fact, you probably cut one in this build of the deck to get it down to 40 cards. But I do think it's a good enough card that you could potentially do that. This deck also has ways to dig deeper into itself with things like Morphing Jar and Sangan and Witch. Uh, limiter removal, of course, at three copies is very strong. If you can stack this card, you can just win the game out of nowhere, uh, especially if you activate them during the damage step. And it's just, I mean, this deck is just very explosive and just can kill your opponent out of nowhere. I'm going to be doing a deeper dive into this sort of deck list when I actually do a video on Machine OTK showing it off. But for now, I think this is the deck that all other decks have to beat. And my build of it is probably not the optimal version. I'm sure other people have better builds of it out there. But no matter what build of this deck you've got, it can be incredibly, incredibly strong. And it's something that may even be tier zero. However, there is, I think, one contender that could potentially dethrone it from the tier zero spot, and that's Empty Jar. So Empty Jar, I think, got a lot of new tools in this format, but it is still very telegraphed, and it does have a lot of hate against it. So I think that it might have a hard time actually carving out a place for itself at the top of the metagame in this format. However, if it is able to get off the races with its strategy, it can be incredibly, incredibly strong. And having things like three Imperial Order at its disposal to prevent your opponent from activating spells to negate your strategy is just very, very powerful. So I think this deck is very good, very cool. And we'll just have to see how good it is when I actually dive into some test games on the channel. But that's going to do it for the guide, as I know that this guide has run very long. And so thanks to all of you that actually made it this far. I will be featuring duels in this format in the coming days. But just know that I probably won't spend too much time in this format, as I do think that it is fairly degenerate. Three Imperial Order is just so meta-warping that it often just makes the format boil down to who drew Imperial Order first. So... I don't really think that this is a healthy format. I do think that it can be a very fun format for people who like these sort of explosive decks. But if that's something that interests you, definitely check out the Discord server. Link will be in the description down below where you can play games in this format with other people testing this out. But I hope that you've enjoyed this video as always. And until next time, I've been Ben from YGO From Zero and I'm signing off.